so everybody, thank you for coming uh, for uh, my talk uh, on silver for furs, uh, uh, trade between uh, Sweden and the steppes. And so I'll be talking about uh, mostly medieval or all medieval uh, things from about the the eighth century to the to the tenth century. Um, this is kind of the period that I, I focus on, uh, and specifically there in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, and yeah, uh, I'm Conrad Hughes. If uh, I haven't met all of you uh, that are here, but uh, I'm I'm very appreciative that you that you've come. This is this is great. Uh, so. Uh, Quickly, uh, I'll, I'll go over kind of the, some of the different points that, that will be part of the presentation and, uh, and, then, and then get, get into the meat of it. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin by talking about the Rus at Ingelheim and this uh, interesting um, event, uh, which we have recorded both uh, historically and archeologically um, uh, through different, different kinds of evidence. Uh, and then we'll talk about different, uh, the, the trade network that, uh, that stretches across uh, Eastern Europe from, from Sweden to the Ponto Caspian steppe, um, specifically the silver dirhams, which are uh, a large part of that trade, and uh, as well as the, the items that are traded for these, uh, these silver dirhams. And dirhams are uh, Islamic coins uh, minted in the medieval period, uh, specifically in the Abbasid Caliphate, well, the, the, uh, the ruling uh, group that, uh, that minted the coins that we're talking about, or most of them, uh, some from the Umi and uh, the previous one. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the, the, the connections this has to uh, steppe nomad uh, or steppe pastoralists and their role within this trade, um, as well as the early Kievan Rus and their, uh, their kind of connections to the steppe nomads and what really uh, is an interesting um, synth synthesization of, of different cultures that come together to, to birth uh, the, the medieval Rus and the, the earliest uh, iterations of uh, the Russian state. Um, and then a little bit about the modern uh, debates and issues that surround this, this topic. So to begin, uh, in uh, 838, uh, the Annals of St. Bertine record uh, uh, and, uh, these uh, travelers showing up to the, the court of Louis the Pious, who is one of the sons of Charlemagne. Um, he is ruling the Eastern Frankish uh, kingdom um, as the, the M Frankish empire is kind of fragmented, the Carolingian empire. And uh, in his, his court uh, arrives uh, Byzantine um, uh, diplomat, a Byzantine ambassador, uh, along with a group uh, that are called the Ros, and uh, R H O S in, in Latin. And this is identified as the, the Latinized version of Rus. Um, uh, they, and these, these men who are with the Byzantine, uh, the, the Byzantine diplomat, um, are, are an enigma to the, to the court. They're not really sure how to take them. Uh, they, they're calling themselves Rus, but the, uh, the chronicler states that they look like Swedes. Um, <laughs> like, like straight up says that within the text, um, they look like Spare. Um, and, uh, and this, this doesn't really, uh, doesn't compute in, in especially the older models of how we think of who the Rus were. And, uh, and especially for, for the, in, for them in the Middle Ages, uh, trying to identify a group of people um, really before they're connected to any sort of state. Um, so the, the Rus go on to say that uh, their ruler is uh, Chikanus, um, which is Latinized Kagan, um, the, uh, the ruler of, of steppe nomad uh, um, uh, polities in this, uh, in this period. Uh, so not something at all connected uh, with, with Sweden or the sphere. Um, they, uh, they seem to be looking like uh, like Scandinavians, or, or or but then calling themselves something else. So there is an interesting uh, disconnect within that. Um, and and some are some scholars have proposed that they are envoys from the the Khazar Kagan uh, sent uh, to the Byzantine court and then headed on home. And then what their purpose is is uh, one of the questions that. Um, is continually asked within within this sphere of study, but uh, but that we'll we'll uh, suss out some of the some of the possible answers of, of who they could be. Um, they're officially uh, you know uh, dispatched to Constantinople by the Chicanos and um, and this guy Theodosius who uh, who is the the ambassador uh, has, has several different roles within the uh, the Byzantine state. Um, he's a Patrikos uh, as well as a 
I guess the best word, I uh, can't remember the Greek word at the moment, but the best, uh, best description of it is a naval uh, quartermaster, um, kind of of the Byzantine Navy. And so uh, it's, it's interesting that he's then with this group of, uh, of people who, who look like uh, Sphere, um, who are known uh, to have um, a, a, a well-developed uh, knowledge of, of, of shipcraft. And, uh, and, and building ships. And so some, some scholars have proposed that uh, this connection is, is that he's sending them back home uh, to either send uh, a fleet or send uh, supplies rather to build a ship uh, from Scandinavia. But the logistics of that are ridiculous. Like it's not really possible uh, to ship a bunch of, uh, of wood from Scandinavia to, to the Byzantine empire. So there's, uh, there's certainly, um, arguments for and against uh, this connection. Um, Louis the Pious doesn't believe them. Uh, he, he ends up imprisoning them for about a year. And then it's assumed that, uh, that they went uh, on back home. And where that home is, is, is an interesting question. Uh, this, these are uh, a group of seals um, of this uh, Patricos uh, the, uh, Theodosus. And uh, they're found in, uh, Hedeby, Ribe, Tiso, and Novgorod. Uh, so the, the first three, you know, all being in Scandinavia, um, makes sense to, to call them Swedes or, you know, um, being within the Scandinavian sphere. But that there, it's also one is found in Novgorod, uh, points to that their, their homeland or their uh, trajected um, path uh, after, after returning from the Byzantine Empire uh, is, is farther reaching than just coming uh, back to Scandinavia. The, the connections uh, between uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Khazars uh, are deep at this point. Uh, there's um, already been a royal marriage uh, between, um, in the eighth century, between uh, the Byzantine emperors, uh, someone in his family, and then one of the Khazars' uh, daughters. So there's, there's a longstanding uh, relationship. There's also an interesting relationship, which uh, is uh, been hard to prove, uh, but uh, many Gotlander uh, scholars um, have uh, have thought that the uh, island of Gotland is deeply connected with the Crimean Goths you know, on the Black Sea, and the Crimean Goths, uh, it is believed, have uh, have members of. Uh, their group, uh, a man named Inger, who is a part of the royal court, and his daughter in, um, in 867 um, marries uh, Basil I, uh, who the, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. So a little bit later, um, they are, are married into the Byzantine family. And so the, the connection between Gotland and these Goths is, is real. Um, uh, and there's, there's good evidence for it, uh, but it's not proven. Um, it certainly plays into this idea of these, this uh, Rus at Ingelheim and their, uh, their official capacity within the Byzantine Empire, as well as uh, in Scandinavia. Um, so what uh, another part of numismatics, so we just looked at these seals, but another part of the, the numismatic evidence behind all this is, is the trade um, which, which connects these, these groups. And uh, the silver dirhams, which uh, are coming from the Abbasid Caliphate, are traded uh, to uh, the Scandinavians and, uh, and other, other groups who are part of this Rus um, for, for pelts. Uh, specifically, um, uh, even Fadlan notes that one Martin pelt is worth two and a half dirhams. So uh, two Martin pelts equals five dirhams. Um, uh, and that's a little bit later. His, his dating is in the 10th century, but uh, this um, direct relationship between Dirham, uh, Dirhams and, and, and Martins uh, is longstanding, as the kuna is a monetary unit used by the Kievan Rus uh, a couple hundred years later, uh, as well as the old Russian uh, word for Martin pelt, um, and it's still used in today for in Croatia for their uh, for their their monetary uh, coinage. Um, Almasudi uh, notes uh, about all of this that uh, Arab and, and Persian kings take pride in their black furs, uh, which they value more highly than those of sable martins and other similar beasts. The kings have hats, caftans, and fur coats made of them, and it is impossible for a king not to possess a caftan or a fur coat lined with these black furs. Uh, and this, this is some of the 
uh, textual evidence behind uh, what we find in a lot of the kaftans and things like that from the Abbasid Caliphate of there being a fur hat fever, um, mm -hmm. a, a fur fever uh, going on in the Caliphate as it is uh, in the midst of a renaissance of, of arts and culture and is really the most developed Western uh, world country, um, though it's you know, in the Middle East mostly, they are far more, more developed in their um, fashions than, uh, than, than Western Europe, as well as, you know, mathematically, uh, geographically, uh, they're um, at the cutting edge at this point in time. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see how these, these furs, much like, uh, well, you, you all probably know this too, but the, the kind of in the, in the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, there's kind of this fur craze in Europe where everybody's trying to buy up all the furs from Siberia in uh, Northern Canada. And uh, so something similar is going on in this period, uh, obviously not to the same extent where they aren't making entire populations of animals extinct, but, uh, but, uh, but on a smaller scale, a medieval scale, uh, the uh, same kind of thing is going on. Um, another element to this trade is obviously slaves, which you you can't uh, you can't deny. Though uh, it's uh, hard uh, archaeologically to really prove um, slaves' part in this trade. There's um, not much evidence you can you can have other than uh, some shackles and things like that found uh, in the archaeological uh, uh, material. However. Um, that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove that there are slaves. But there is uh, there is evidence within uh, within texts as the as the Abbas Abbasid Caliphate highly prizes pale skinned uh, slaves, uh, particularly uh, particularly women um, in in their court. And uh, as you can see in this this uh, 10th century um, painting, uh, these two two women back here um, are a representation of this um, and uh, the Al, Al Sabalik. Uh, uh, is the kind of term they use for, for pale skinned uh, people. Um, so with this, uh, we can assume that, uh, that the Rus are, uh, are both bringing these furs uh, as well as slaves uh, down the rivers to, to trade. Um, there's also evidence that uh, eunuchs who also carry this title of, of uh, al Sakaliba, that's Al Sakaliba. Um, uh, this, this term for pale skinned people that usually gets or has in the 20th century been associated many times with slobs, um, but there's really no uh, particular evidence to point it to any ethnicity, but rather it's, uh, it's a, um, a coloring uh, term about, uh, about what they look like. Um, so uh, in the Abbasid court, there's also a, a good amount of eunuchs that have this, uh, have this title also. So both um, women to, to be in the harem, as well as eunuchs being used within the court as translators specifically um, within, within the Abbasid court. So it's an interesting um, function that these different people are, uh, are taking. So uh, that, that kind of uh, whole, whole discussion uh, uh, brings us to the, the ethnicity or rather the linguistic heritage of uh, who these Rus are, um, uh, where they're where they're coming from, uh, and uh, though in the in the 20th, 19th and 20th century, the whole Normanist and anti-Normanist uh, theories were thrown around a lot, and uh, Slavic uh, scholars wanted to prove that it was all Slavs that are the beginning of the Rus state, and Scandinavian scholars wanted to prove that it was all Scandinavians. But the most recent research uh, uh, points to to a mixture. Of, of both these groups, as well as uh, Finno-Ugric people and Baltic peoples, who um, who are also a, an integral part of this trade, and and some of the evidence we have in that is uh, is that it seems that there is at times a, a pidgin language um, emerging uh, between uh, with these groups in in uh, in northeastern uh, uh, Europe, and so uh, this uh, through different. Uh, Linguistic studies, uh, they've kind of connected that you see a uh, blending of different languages in, in early, uh, early Slavic um, uh, context. Um, so, oops, there we go. Uh, so there is a, seems to be like a bilingualism uh, within this uh, within this economic sphere, but we also know bilingualism uh, within uh, a military and political spheres, just as I said, uh, talking about with the, the eunuchs being used. Um, so it seems that uh, these 
these many different layers kind of all, all stack upon each other and to, to better support um, a, a multicultural kind of beginning of the Rus um, and multilingual origins of them. Uh, one scholar, uh, Marika Maggi, who's an Estonian uh, scholar, has, uh, has a book called uh, In Osterberger, uh, which, uh, which discusses this at length, uh, as well as discussing the origins of the term Rus and, and the different possibilities of, of where it comes from, as well as the possibility of it coming from multiple origins, uh, from the Slavic word Ros for river, or um, some connection to the island of Rugen uh, on the Baltic, which is, uh, which is at this point um, uh, mostly populated by Slavs, but as well as by Scandinavians who have uh, set up an emporium there. Uh, also, there's an Old Norse term, uh, Rothos, um, and rothuz, uh, meaning rowers, uh, as well as a Finnish term for, uh, for people living around the Malaran Lake region uh, near, near Birka, uh, uh, Rautsi, which, uh, Rutsi, um, which uh, all these different like possibilities of the, of the origins of the term Rus, uh, whether they predate the term being used for a group of people or come afterwards is, is uncertain, but that there's so many different um, actual words which connect to the actions and the places that these the Rus likely came from. Uh, it's, you know, the coincidence is certainly possible, but there's also possibility that there, there's a deeper, uh, deeper connection. So turning uh, more back to the, the numismatic evidence, the, the coins. Uh, this, this map uh, shows the distribution of coin hoards from the uh, 8th to the 13th century, but most of them uh, coming from the late 9th, 10th, and early 11th century, where you have uh, just an enormous amount of, of these dirhams deposited all over, all over uh, Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, but especially in Sweden, um, the island of Gotland, uh, uh, around the Malaran Lake region, as well as here in Skåne, um, which is, you know, kind of what drew me here. <laughs> um, uh, well, why I ended up coming here is because, you know, this is where we have uh, these these coins deposited. Um, oh, weird transition. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, so uh, the island of, of Birka uh, has uh, has as many of these in the, in the region around as many of these coins found. Um, but uh, there's also interesting evidence for its connections with step, step nomad groups, uh, specifically the Mayars, uh, what is today uh, Hungarians um, to the rest of the world. Um, but uh, uh, on the island of Birka, there's a, there's a garrison uh, right near the hall, um, which uh, has a, a number of, uh, of items which point towards there being a group of highly skilled and highly specialized archers that are, are coming from the Mayars. Uh, from uh, these uh, quiver kind of a brackets, as you see here, as well as, I wish you could get rid of that thing for you. Well, in any case, uh, as well as uh, an archer's ring um, and other uh, belt buckles and things like that, which, which point towards there being um, uh, from, from a step nomad group. Uh, which group that is, is, is hard to determine, but uh, the Myers has the, has the best uh, evidence for it. And at the time of uh, kind of in our framing, um, at the time of this, this Rus at Ingelheim, the Myers are a part of the Khazar Khaganate. This is before they've moved westward into what is today Hungary. And they're still um, one of the many groups that are a part of this uh, uh, Khaganate conglomerate. Um, which isn't uh, isn't at all a, a, a monoculture, but is a very very diverse uh, group of people, as as all step cognates are. Um, so it's so it's interesting to see uh, this is these are from the 10th century, so a little bit later. But interesting to see that uh, a group of um, highly skilled professionals are brought to Birka, um, likely as mercenaries or bodyguards, um, but, uh, but keeping their, their traditional weaponry. And uh, this is not kind of weaponry that you can just pick up and learn um, quickly. It's something that you're trained from a young age to use, usually from horseback. Um, the evidence of the, the horse, horses comes in, in, in the grave, the, that, um, in some of the graves where, where there are horses buried with the soldiers, just as there are in, in Sweden already, but you, you see that within the, their graves as well. Um, so this, this step uh, connection is very interesting. Um, and, uh, and 
it is a you know this liminal area between the, the Abbasid Caliphate and Eastern Europe and, and Scandinavia. Uh, and, and some of the some of the coins uh, that uh, that we find are are not from the Abbasid Caliphate actually, though the majority are. There's a, there's a certain percentage that come from uh, Bulgars as well as uh, Khorasan, um, kind of a, a breakout um, uh, state from the uh, from the Abbasid Caliphate, as well as from the Khazars. Um, and, and that some of that evidence comes from uh, coins like this, uh, which have uh, a tamga, uh, um, kind of a put in the middle of where the where the the normal um, you know, uh, Muhammad is the, is the messenger of God um, of statement, which is on all the Abbasid coins. And so the, this tamga uh, is uh, a longstanding, uh, you know, twig-like uh, kind of clan, um, uh, clan marker, uh, which uh, dates back uh, into antiquity and has been used by many different groups. But in this period, we do know that it's, uh, it's associated with uh, these Ponto-Caspian steppe groups, uh, specifically the Khazars. And so, uh, so there's an interesting uh, alteration to these coins, um, and this this figure uh, then then by some scholars is connected to uh, later coins um, uh, and and even coins from this period that have been scratched upon and graffitied upon by uh, by Rus, um, uh, putting uh, what uh, might be similar to the to the tamga, um, as as you can see these uh, kind of very stick like. Um, ones uh, certainly have some uh, association which could be uh, which could be made with this, but um, it's it's certainly certainly it's questionable. You know, there's no no way to um, be sure that these are the same. But these this symbol though is co-opted by the earliest Rus dynasty, the Rurikids, um, who who use it as uh, as kind of their badge uh, for uh, um, their their dynasty for for showing you know what is what is uh, theirs and marking it. So we have a, a number of coins which are um, which are graffitied this way, and there's a number of these dirhams, as well as uh, a seal from uh, Olga, the mother of, of Sviatoslav, um, one of the first uh, Rus rulers, um, Konigers, um, and uh, and it, it shows not only the uh, the bird like um, uh, rurikid symbol. But also some kind of made up Greek uh, uh, put around it. Uh, it doesn't actually say anything in Greek. They just kind of look like Greek, as well as this cross. And so this is why it's uh, associated with Olga, uh, Stratoslav's mother, as she was uh, was a Christian and, and did actually go to go to Constantinople and um, or. Some sources say she did. The Byzantines say she didn't, but um, so, but the, the the Russian sources uh, say that she did. The Russian Primary Chronicle. Um, so uh, this this connection with the the tamga uh, and and the sign of the Rurikids, uh, though though maybe tenuous, um, certainly might be another one of these evidences that that kind of show this connection between the Rus and the the steppe nomad groups, uh, the, the the Khazars. Um, Another another place where uh, many of these coins are found, as well as uh, tons of other uh, silver, uh, some of which is uh, these coins melted down, um, is is in, on Gotland, uh, and the Spillings hoard is is one of the one of the good examples of this. And within that hoard, there is uh, uh, several coins which, instead of saying uh, Muhammad is the prophet of, of Allah of God, it, they say that Moses. Is the prophet of God, and this uh, at first uh, scholars weren't sure what to make of it. Um, uh, what uh, what uh, why would the uh, Abbasid Caliphate change what they would say when they they certainly revere Moses as well, but their coinage consistently only says um, that it is uh, Muhammad is the prophet. Um, however, uh, they believe we believe that uh, this uh, switch uh, shows that these are imitations, and that is. One by the silver is not quite as high quality as the, the coming out of the Abbasid Caliphate, which is at about 90%, so almost sterling silver, um, where these are from 85 to 80% 80, uh, uh, silver uh, content. Uh, so that being one of the evidence, but also this switch and it lining up with the conversion of the elites or a group of elites within the Khazar Khaganate to Judaism. And this, uh, this pointing to uh, a date uh, at the latest um, of, of 837 to 838 of this, 
of this conversion uh, happening. Uh, there's evidence that it started in the late uh, 8th century and uh, is kind of a slow process going on um, within the Khazar court. Um, uh, not that everyone is converting, it's not a mass conversion, but we do see that uh, within the court, the, uh, the Jewish element is, is gaining power, possibly, or even um, uh, gaining supremacy. Um, as there, there's kind of two Khazar rulers, the Kagan and the Bek, and the Bek is kind of the secondary ruler. And we have evidence uh, that we'll look at in a moment that uh, he's the first one to convert and his family is the one. So this the second king, um, who's the military king, let's say, where the other is more of a ritualistic king. We also have some coins that say this from Mubokra, um, which is great. You know, uh, another reason I came here uh, is because uh, they, they this uh, this coin here does say that uh, Moses is the prophet of God, which is an uh, interesting and great find, and, and shows that um, though by the by the ninth century Mubokra isn't as important as a site as it once was, as, as we see more uh, trade, especially coming from, uh, or coming into Gotland and, and the Malaran Lake region, um, Upakra still is uh, is a part of this. And, and that, that goes with certainly the finds at Tiso and Ribe, which are closer uh, over in this part of the Baltic Sea. Um, another interesting uh, part of uh, these coins uh, usage is uh, we find many, that have these, these holes uh, drill, drilled into them. Uh, and uh, we believe that, well, we're, we're fairly certain because we found plenty uh, that have been turned into uh, brakete, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, amulets, um, which, uh, which uh, proliferate all over uh, Northern Europe, but, but especially within uh, Rus uh, contexts, as well as uh, in Sweden. Um, this from uh, Gnezdovo in, uh, in central western Russia on the Dnieper. Um, this, this, again, points to, to more of this kind of uh, um, connections between, between these groups, but also uh, that Brakate, um, Braktate, sorry, Braktate are, uh, are also uh, used several centuries before and continually in uh, the Scandinavian context and as well as uh, Germanic context as symbols of um, legitimacy in a political uh, context or economic context. Uh, this coming from uh, 400 to 600 uh, from, from Sweden. And, um, and being a, not a coin, but, uh, but being a, uh, a, a device of uh, a worn for legitimacy to show that you have, you have a, an agreement with another group and that this is um, a, you know, a partnership between people. And so the using kind of these theories behind these these uh, these amulets uh, to the coins being turned into amulets, uh, it, it certainly seems like that they have a status within the economic sphere of, of this trade going on, that the coins are worn to show that you have um, that you have legitimacy to trade um, uh, within the, the Rus sphere, within, within from, from Scandinavia to the, to the steppes, um, as they're found all, all throughout this, uh, whole, um, whole expanse. So looking at, uh, at, at texts again, um, uh, Ibn, uh, Koradadbe, um, uh, speaks on the, uh, the Arus, um, in the, the Book of Roads and Kingdoms. And this is, uh, and probably the second oldest text mentioning them, where the, the one from the 830s is the, is the oldest annals of St. Curtin. And uh, he says, uh, a tribe from among the As Asakalipa, um, Arus, are, are bringing furs of beavers and black foxes and swords uh, from the most distant parts of the Sakaliba land. Uh, to the Sea of Rum, where the ruler of Arum, the Byzantine emperor, levies tithes on them. If they want, they travel on the Itil, the Volga River, uh, of the Asakaliba, Al Al and pass through uh, Kamlij, uh, town of the Khazars, where the ruler uh, of it levies tithes upon them. Then they arrive at the Sea of Gurjan, and they land on the shore uh, of which they choose. On occasion, they bring their merchandise on camels from Gurjan to Baghdad, where Asakaliba eunuchs serve them as interpreters, just as I was, I was saying earlier. Uh, they claim to be Christians and pay only a head tax. Uh, and so within the different uh, 
um, religions of Abraham, the, the, the kind of uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and I Islam, uh, there's uh, a certain amount of respect for each other's religion. So though we have no evidence of the Rus actually converting at this point, or, or, or Slavic groups, uh, um, it seems that they're at least pretending to be Christian to get a discount. Um, <laughs> However, this uh, this same uh, this same idea uh, can be extended to to another group of traders uh, called the Radonites, who are uh, a group of of Jewish uh, merchants uh, that are far traveled across of Europe as well as as far as uh, Eastern China. Um, so their text uh, text uh, Ibn Khordadbin uh, uh, of the ninth from the ninth century he uh, he speaks of them saying. Uh, these merchants speak Arabic, Persian, Greek, Latin, Frankish, Spanish, and Slavic, and they travel from west to east, from east to west, sometimes by land, sometimes by sea. But from the west, they bring eunuchs, female slaves, young boys, brocades, beaver, marten, and other furs and swords. Uh, and he goes on to explain the, the different routes they take and, uh, and uh, enumerating on um, their role within the trade that is, you know, with the Silk Road, um, what, we, what we think of uh, today is that, and that they seem to be an integral part of this. And this status, uh, which they have within, within all this, seems to, to point to their, um, their influence upon the, upon the Khazar Khaganate and this, uh, this conversion to Judaism, in that it's a economic as well as a political move by the, the Khazars to, um, uh, to incorporate themselves into this kind of, uh, this religions of Abraham world that they're in. You know, everybody's, everybody's Christian or Muslim and they're coming in as shamanic um, uh, Tengriism. And uh, they have to figure out a way to, uh, even the playing field and, uh, and and be able to incorporate themselves into the you know Eastern Mediterranean world and and some of that uh, could certainly uh, be economic reasons as well as political um, and, and also religious because there are deep connections um, that could be made between uh, um, Judaism and and Tengriism and that Tengriism does have a greatest of the gods. Um, it is uh, different than a most shamanic beliefs in that there is a, um, a pinnacle of them and, and Tengri is this. And so there's a lot of different uh, things to go in there, but I won't, I won't go further for right now. <laughs> um, that's, that's another article. <laughs> um, but to, to give, give it a, a good uh, a scope of the Khazar influence, uh, their, their really homeland is, this, uh, is the Pondo Caspian Steppe. They're uh, north of the, uh, the Black and Caspian Sea. However, their influence does stretch far further um, to, uh, to what is, uh, you know, Bulgar is, is number seven here, as well as uh, in the eighth century, uh, they conquer most of the Caucasus before um, in kind of the turmoil of the Umayyad Caliphate falling apart, um, they, uh, they take advantage. Um, and in all this, they are um, one, of the, one of the more powerful, if not, um, depending on how you, how you gauge power, um, uh, at a certain point, uh, the most powerful uh, group in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and Osterwerger being kind of the, uh, uh, the Old Norse term uh, for these Eastern lands, uh, lands east of the Baltic, um, that uh, the Rus would have been um, a big part of uh, trading in and kind of this whole Osterwerger mythology, like Odin coming out of the East and all these kind of things. Uh, scholars have certainly tried to connect it to this um, later trade stuff and try to try to make these um, uh, make these connections, but I, I don't think anyone's proven anything yet. I don't think we can we can say anything for sure about that. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, another text about uh, about this uh, this conversion of, of the Khazars. Um, Al-Masudi uh, in the Metals of Gold from uh, the mid uh, 10th century uh, says, uh, says of them, the inhabitants of Khazarian capital, Itil, are Muslim, Christian, Jews, and pagans. The Jews are the king, the Bek, as I mentioned earlier, uh, his entourage, and the Khaz Khazars of his tribe. Uh, the king accepts Judaism, this king being the Bek, uh, during the caliphate of Harun uh, al-Rashid, uh, which he, you know, ruled from the, the late 8th to the early 9th century. And so uh, this, this being one of the other markers for when we can date uh, this, this conversion began. 
Um, he says a number of Jews joined him from other Muslim countries and from the Byzantine Empire. Uh, this was because the emperor uh, converted uh, the Jews of his country to Christianity by force, and a large number of Jews fled uh, from Rome, from Byzantium, uh, to the Khazar country. And this is substantiated by Byzantine sources as well. They kind of, uh, yeah, they try to force all the, all the Jews to convert. It's another one of these terrible events that has happened throughout history over and over. Um, and we have it in, in later medieval history as well, all over Europe. But uh, in this period, it seems to show that uh, this, this influx uh, of Jewish people moving into Khazarian lands is also prompted by this. And so we have the Radonites uh, coming uh, through their lands as traders, um, as well as uh, their uh, connection uh, to, to this kind of uh, migration of Jewish people into their lands. Um, and there's some, some good uh, kind of frameworks for this, uh, this mixture of uh, shamanic beliefs, Tengriism, with, uh, with monotheistic beliefs. Uh, as the Uyghurs converted uh, in, in their, their upper echelons of society, just as the Khazars, um, and not like a forced everyone's converting, but just uh, certain of the elite, uh, um, elite groups uh, converted to Manichaeism, uh, the Uyghurs in the 8th century, early 8th century. And so for about 100 years, uh, they, they you know, uh, profess Manichaeism, which is this mix of monotheism and Buddhism. And it's a, it's a very complex religion. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we, you know, it's not, uh, this conversion doesn't, doesn't stand alone. Um, we also, uh, when, we, when we turn to the, the archeological evidence of, uh, of this, it is much harder to, to really prove anything um, because most of the um, uh, Khazar uh, artifacts and things like this from this period still show the traditional uh, hunting scenes, wrestling scenes, warriors on horseback, uh, rather than a proliferation of uh, uh, artifacts uh, that, that are uh, definitely can be confirmed as Jewish. Um, one example uh, up here is the, this um, uh, star metal, metal disc, um, which could be associated with Judaism, but the same star could also be associated with uh, Tengriism, as the sun is an important part of, of, uh, of their uh, beliefs as well. So it, it can go both ways. There's also some bricks that might have the Star of David carved on them. Um, but that site is that those bricks were found is actually underwater now because the uh, the Soviet Union decided to flood a um, <laughs> flood a valley and this the uh, fortress of Sarkel was there and uh, was uh, uh, is underwater you know so archaeology being done there is is non-existent at this point maybe eventually we'll be able to either drain it or do underwater archaeology there but the all the data is now you know uh, mm -hmm. severely uh, um, damaged. Um, so there's uh, hard to hard to say um, in the archaeological evidence, but that I think points more to obviously this being like an elite, um, very small group of people converting rather than in mass. Um, so turning back to our, our Rus, um, so we kind of delved into this, uh, the, the step nomad side for a little while, um, thinking about uh, how are the Rus a part of this and, and what is their role within this? Are they um, traders alone or are they connected with these Radonite traders and serving as uh, even bodyguard mercenaries for um, these, these, uh, these Jewish people who have the longstanding and, 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 and long geographic uh, connections as well as the uh, linguistic knowledge, which maybe they don't have as much uh, to trade with, with the steppes as well as uh, as far as the Abbasid Caliphate. Um, some of the, the evidence that points towards the early early Rus uh, being connected with the Khazars is uh, is the example of Sviatoslav uh, the first, um, kind of uh, the or you could say the third uh, um, uh, ruler of the of the uh, early Rus, the Rurikids, um, and uh, he uh, is is described uh, by uh, Leo uh, Diaconus uh, in in 971. As, uh, as looking much more like a, a steppe nomad than uh, a Scandinavian or a Slav. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll read a, a short excerpt from this. Uh, Skatoslav uh, crossed the river in a kind of Scythian boat, he, which Scythian is used for like anybody at this point. <laughs> like they just kind of throw this term around. Um, he handled the, the oar in the same way as his men. His appearance was as follows. 
He was medium height, neither tall nor too short. He had bushy brows, blue eyes, and was snub nose. He shaved his beard, but wore a long and bushy mustache. His head was shaven except for a lock of hair on one side as a sign of nobility of his clan. Excuse me. And he goes on to enumerate more, but uh, this uh, chub, uh, hair, hair lock, which, uh, which is, is, he is described as having is um, known and, and is clearly a, a part of uh, steppe nomad culture, something that we see uh, within the warrior cast, castes uh, of, of steppe nomads stretching all, uh, all the way through Central Asia. Um, so, and it's in not only from this period, but going on much later as well. So it's interesting that he is trying to even look like a Kagan, maybe. Um, uh, one, uh, one scholar, uh, Brutskus, uh, has argued that the administration of these, uh, what he calls russo varangians uh, took many of its terms and customs from Turkic origin, uh, from titles of military and bureaucratic offices to their weight system, as they have a weight system of, uh, using 40s, um, rather than, uh, kind of the traditional Scandinavian, um, his uh, Svetoslavs uh, is, is a charged figure in Ukrainian uh, history as he's seen this kind of like the progenitor to the, their state of the early Kievan Rus um, as he was a, a conqueror and all this stuff. So there's a lot of issues surrounding, you know, uh, this, um, the depictions of him and, and you know, how, we, how people think about him today. Uh, however, um, the, the large group of, of warriors, his Drujina, which he had, uh, he had surrounding him, um, which is attested in the Russian Primary Chronicle, as well as in, in Byzantine sources, uh, points to him acting more like uh, a steppe Kagan than um, what we think of as uh, a stable sedentary ruler and what his son, uh, Vladimir the Great, um, what, what he acts like. There's a, there's a distinct difference between his actions and his son's, where his son Christianizes the Rus, he, he sets up um, a more stable singular capital while, uh, while Svetoslav is, is very much just running around with a horde of men on horses and raiding everyone. Um, that's kind of his MO. Um, there, he also is, is mentioned in, uh, in multiple, uh, um, one, I think it's one text and one um, uh, stone carving as, as Kagan uh, Svetoslav. So we have this, this connection of him even using this term or people associating this term with him uh, as well. So uh, this, you know, there's, it brings up a lot of uh, interesting, um, interesting connections between steppe nomads and the early Rus. And how do we, uh, how do we define these people who said, well, we're ruled by this Kagan, um, but no, we're not Swedes, but they look like sphere. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting, um, interesting concept that, I mean, I think, we can further understand better if we if we continue to obviously do archaeology in this, uh, as well as um, a numismatic kind of uh, statistical analysis of, of these coins and the um, the concentration of them and, and where we find those here in, in Scandinavia and the Baltic. So uh, obviously, yeah, the question you know uh, again comes back to who were these roofs that show up at Ingelheim? Who were the who were the roofs later as well? Because um, Sviatoslav. Uh, his, uh, his mother Olga is believed to have maybe been Baltic origin. Um, he's, uh, his name is very Slavic. Um, many of the other uh, people mentioned in his kind of retinue in, um, in Byzantine trade agreements are also using Slavic names, uh, not Scandinavian names, which uh, you know, certainly points to some connection to that, but it also rather maybe points to them being one or the other, it being Scandinavians who did move into this area are immediately marrying um, Slavic women uh, and uh, Baltic women and, uh, and it quickly becoming a, a multi, multicultural uh, um, group of people, the Rus, uh, rather than uh, one I idea or the other, one, one ethnicity or the other, if you want to use that term. Um, this all uh, uh, can kind of, can't be answered exactly with a DNA uh, analysis. Uh, um, uh, at this point, I don't think um, there's enough data uh, from this period to really say, oh, they're Slavic or they're, uh, or they're Scandinavian. Um, but this, this also does kind of go into the, um, the issues uh, behind uh, what is now a, um, a modern uh, concept uh, and, and 
uh, racist uh, concept of the Ashkenazi Jews being um, being from the Khazars, who are not all converted to Judaism. It's a very small group of them who who are uh, who are Jewish, and their uh, their connections um, to Ashkenazi Jews of today are, are very slight, if any. Um, and so, but this these theories are. If you type in Khazar online, half of the stuff you'll see will be crazy anti-Semitic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's dangerous. And like any of this research, like there's a lot of it's it's loaded. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things you have to kind of sift through and make sure that um, that if you do do a DNA studies, that they aren't uh, aren't supporting something that uh, that is um, racially charged. You know, things have to be done thoroughly. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, uh, another question that uh, within modern debate is uh, who are the Khazars um, now? Like who are their ancestors today? Uh, the Cossacks at one point were thought to be um, the Khazars, the Cossacks being from the Crimean area, the Black Sea region uh, back in the 1600s, you know, brought into the, the, the Russian empire as a, as a special military force to defend their borders. Um, they, they, this theory is pretty, Pretty debunked as well is uh, Cossacks are not a, uh, a monolith of ethnicity. There are a lot of different people, yes, coming from uh, the steppe area. Um, Kazakhs uh, today, so uh, people from Kazakhstan, uh, do claim uh, this uh, Khazarian heritage and, and say that, you know, we're the ancestors of the Khazars. And there's some uh, DNA evidence to, to point to that, but uh, any geographical place does not have a stagnant population. We all know this as archaeologists. I mean, people are moving in and out. And so anyone claiming, you know, ancient heritage like this is, uh, is easily turned to, to modern political uh, uh, things and, and really uh, um, misused. Uh, so it's a, it's a dangerous thing um, doing, doing some of this kind of research, especially um, thinking ethnographically. And that leads into this is all all, most of this is all happening in uh, in the ex-Soviet Union land. So, so places that are heavily influenced by a very pro-Slavic narrative um, that uh, Ukraine is a little better than Russia to these days. They work more with the United States and Western countries. They want to be a part of the EU. So yeah, they have to. But um, uh, but they uh, they also have a have the, many people in Ukraine are are also very in this pro-Slavic kind of ideology that they want to promote. Um, so so doing archaeology in these places, uh, which I haven't got to do yet, is is difficult. And uh, and um, you know you to do it, you might have to not be completely clear with what you're after because people will, um, will want to, you to have a certain slant to your research. Um, as I said earlier, Sarkel, uh, one of the, the big sites from the Khazars is underwater and uh, the Khazar capital is, uh, is still unfound. We have a few uh, possible locations for it, but this kind of uh, center of where their uh, royal court would have, would have wintered, you know, kind of moved around, but um, isn't isn't yet confirmed. And so, and this is this is all partly because of the disinterest by the the, the Soviet state and even post Soviet states uh, in this um, in this line of of the of, of the evidence. You know, you know, they're not as interested in the Khazar uh, connections. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. All. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so some of this is in an article I published over the summer um, on Kronika uh, Journal. So if you're interested in reading the article that talks about kind of the, the Rus, uh, Rus connections to the Khazars um, specifically, um, it's there. And any questions? Yeah. I was wondering actually if they've done some uh, isotope analysis on the bodies of Khazars who have moved around. Uh, being dug up in different places mm -hmm. uh, to try to track these some of the movements. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's been some, but some of the problem is it's all most of the digging done in in these areas is done in the early early 20th century, late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of it's not uh, digitized, um, one, but also a lot of it is probably misinterpreted as Scythian. 
um, you know, and this kind of thing. Uh, but we do have we do have some that is is being used. Um, the problem uh, a recent article came out in 2019 um, is an interesting article, but the they only look at like eight bodies from from the Sarkel. Uh, region so they they got into the archives of, of stuff that was dug up there before it was put under water and um and they make a lot of really grand sweeping assumptions with only looking at eight bodies from a place that was only inhabited by Khazars for 140 years so it's and like they're not a they're not a monoculture you know the Khazars are at the very top and likely came from Central Asia um uh but they are uh, the Gok Turks. They're, they're thought to be the remnant of the Gok Turk ruling the Shina uh, clan. Um, and they are uh, definitely a minority within the Khazar Khaganate, you know? And so everybody else is Bulgars, uh, Kipchaks, um, Mayars, you know, all sorts of different groups. So some has been done, but not enough, definitely. Yeah, and not a, and not a, Equip, uh, equitably, you know, uh, yeah. 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 I've got a question. Uh, why does this sort of trade system and the, uh, that happens here, why does it start to decline? Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, I imagine it's not uh, such a big thing uh, in the, uh, uh, like when the hands arises in the North Sea. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it, by then it is already already well on the decline and no longer is important. Um, some of that probably being uh, because the connections between the Rus and the, and the Scandinavian kings is waning uh, by the 13th century. Um, however, also because they're actually in, in Scandinavia and in, in, in Europe, they're minting coins and minting more and more coins. Um, so this, this shift of making your own uh, bullion, your own, your own coinage, um, doesn't, it means they don't need the Abbasid coinage as much, as well as the Abbasid Caliphate uh, crumbling uh, in, in the 11th century. Um, and, and so, uh, or starting to crumble in the 11th, really falls apart in the, in the 12th. Um, but yeah, so you have different states are fracturing, and this kind of breaks apart this, this trade network, which for several hundred years is really important for uh, Scandinavia for bringing in all this silver, this wealth. Um, but as, as the Abbasids decline and as um, the Western European uh, um, kind of uh, kingship uh, starts, to, uh, starts to gain more power, uh, it's, it's no longer as important to get this far away silver. Um, they, don't, they, don't want, they don't want furs as much either because it, no. they have less wealth there as well. So it's kind of a lot of different factors coming up. But it's also a factor then that uh, we start uh, uh, mining more silver in Scandinavia. Yes. Uh, uh, well, that, uh, I don't know how much, uh, how big the, uh, the um, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't talked for all day. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Uh, how, how big the, uh, the mining operations are in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I imagine there they must be on a steady rise. Yes, yes. Um, by, I mean, I can't remember the dates exactly, but I want to say by the 12th century in Scandinavia, they're minting their own coins and they're, you know, obviously digging up more silver to do so. So all that's uh, as as power is centralized, you know, in, in the, the proto states of, of Scandinavia, you know, once they're no longer conigers, no longer sea kings and they're starting to become a more more stable kingdoms. Yeah, the, these mining operations uh, start to develop more. So, yeah, you see. Um, a lot of factors coming into why it's no longer important to, to trade. Yeah. I think you know what the, the others is different, like felt as interacted with the Rus thought of them. Um, mm -hmm. like how did you know how did they react and suddenly this weirdos from up north were showing up to want to trade? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they in the in the you know medieval ethnographies or whatever you want to call it, like even Fadlan's work. Uh, they're certainly shocked by them, but in some ways they admire them. So it's kind of a weird, like, oh, they're dirty in some texts, but then in others, like, oh, their their physique is so beautiful. <laughs> and so you get a weird kind of uh, a mixture of, uh, you know, um, respect in some ways, and then also like, oh, but they're not like us. Um, so there's definitely an other in their mind. Um, yeah. 
and and then as as the Rus state uh, uh, gains gains more more power, they become you know more hostile uh, to them, and so they're they're kind of like the the political uh, relations because uh, they're usually uh, usually allied with the Byzantines, not always, but usually. <laughs> um, and then the Varangian Guards, you know, becoming a part of the the Byzantine uh, uh, court, and they're they're sending you know in, in Vladimir's time he sends five thousand. Varangians, uh, so Scandinavians or Slavs, uh, to to the to the Byzantine Emperor, uh, who uses them against the Alusid Caliphate. So you kind of have um, a crumbling of these diplomatic ties as well as, as other ties are are gotten stronger. And so we do see an increase in the eleventh, the late tenth and eleventh century of Byzantine coins and Byzantine artifacts in Scandinavia, um, in a kind of a drop off of ones coming from the Abbasid Caliphate, other other uh, Islamic groups. Yeah, it's, uh, and, uh, it's interesting what they say also with uh, like what they think about each other. Because I, I was thinking earlier about uh, how, how some of these, uh, like uh, the, the I don't remember his name, uh, the Ukrainian founder, mm -hmm. uh, how he adapted sort of the Khazar ways, and it, it also reminds me of uh, of how uh, the, the second wave of M Muslim uh, expansion. Uh, I mean, uh, um, yeah, yeah, Islamic expansion mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, in the uh, 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 Indian Ocean, yeah. what is spreads uh, through trade, uh, because you'd rather trade with someone from your own religion, mm -hmm. and so uh, integrating like social practices uh, in order to enrich yourself, it's it's patterns where you see all over, and yeah. much later with, with colonialism as well, but far more new ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, yeah, and the whole connection between the there kind of being a discount if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim uh, in the different groups is uh, you know pagans are the bad ones. Yes. Uh, you don't want to look like a pagan uh, in the, in the you know Eastern Mediterranean uh, Black Sea uh, region. Yeah. <laughs> have you been to Gotham? I've seen pictures. I can't wait. I'll get over there soon. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Almost as good as me and Kevin after her. Another comment, uh, because you, you mentioned uh, Birkia. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, uh, a very recent study with a lot of isotope anal uh, analysis uh, from Birkia. And it showed that it was a very diverse uh, uh, cast of graves. Yeah. Um, uh, there, I don't know if you have looked at it. I think I have read something like this. I don't think I've incorporated it into this this talk. Um, but I think I know what you're talking about. I yeah, yeah. Remember, I, uh, I just thought it. I'd mention it. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, um, I mean, I I feel like one of my my weak points is 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 that adna stuff and understanding all of that and that's part of why i'm here in loon <laughs> to get to get better at it and we've actually been doing it this last week uh mm -hmm. studying this stuff so no um but yes yes certainly there's there's uh, more diversity than we realize yeah. uh in the in the medieval world and uh you know the connections are far more uh, far reaching than than you know uh, in the 19th century, what people thought, um, and even the 20th century. So, yeah.